Welcome to the Qualified Tutor Podcast. I'm your host, Ludo Miller, and I'll be interviewing tutors and thought leaders from across the tutoring landscape to inspire, inform, and motivate you to become the best tutor you can be. The Qualified Tutor Community is a safe and supportive space for tutors who love to learn and grow. We offer training, resources, ideas, and a chance to connect with like-minded tutors. If you'd like to continue the conversation, join our Qualified Tutor Community at www.qualifiedtutorcommunity.org or find it in the show notes. Welcome to the Qualified Tutor Podcast. Uh, today, we are delighted to be joined by Neil Calmeadow and, of course, wonderful Qualified Tutor founder, Julia Silva. Um, Neil is uh, a podcasting guru himself. He, as you can tell by his background, he is a uh, guitaring maestro uh, and he is, a, a, of course, a tutor. Uh, he is the host of uh, the uh, Tutor podcast, which we are avid listeners of. And we welcome him today to really discuss what the magic of tutoring is and how he brings music and tutoring together. Welcome to both of you. Hi, guys. Good Very to happy to be here. And hi, Julia Ludo. Hi, nice to see you, Neil. Good morning, Ludo. Morning, morning all. Um, so Neil, there is, there's so much that we are, are going to get onto. We know that we want to, to really pick your brains about what makes music and tutoring so special and, and how you are able to bring them together. We can see there that you have a, you know, a recording studio you know, of, of really one of the highest standards. We were saying just earlier that with only one camera each, Julia and I, and only one microphone here, I feel far inferior to your, your <laughs> setup. But um, we'd really like to kick off, Neil, with our first question that we love asking our guests. Um, what kind of student were you, Neil? And did you ever have a tutor yourself? Um, I would have described myself as probably a highly dysfunctional, disruptive, violent, nasty kid. Uh, <laughs> I've outgrown it. I was the kid that would always get up and just run out of the class. I, a horrible child. <laughs> uh, I think had it been an available diagnosis, I would have been somewhere on the spectrum of autism. But over time, I've figured out and been helped to moderate that and to bring it under control and actually make it a useful tool rather than something to label myself with and just fall off the edge of the world with. Mm -hmm. I have to jump in. How does that inform your tutoring, Neil? I think it, what it has allowed me to do is be very focused on things, to have an idea of the direction I want to go in and steer closer to that, you know, that focus the attention to detail. And really, part of it is not falling into line with conventional thinking mm. um, and identifying what really works best and be pretty headstrong and stubborn about it there's a yes. big streak of bloody mindedness yes runs through me that uh and and when you're talking there about challenging conventions so would you say that there's more freedom to challenge conventions in the way that you educate absolutely yeah i, uh, I went back to university in my 30s uh, to do a music degree and so much of what I was being taught didn't make sense. It was very difficult for me to accept the rather dogmatic and obscurantist um, smokescreen almost, I felt, between the core of what we do as musos and the way it's taught. Right. So, yeah, challenge convention, always. So how's that reflected in the way you tutor? It's a it's, um it's the recognition that for most people, conventional teaching doesn't work. Uh, most people who pick the guitar to learn to play quit. The, the stick rate is very low. But by going a different way, rather than learning a bunch of things that are fundamentally dissimilar, we can start with ideas and concepts that are familiar to the student, um, consistent within themselves, and take a different approach so my stick rate with students is pretty high. We don't lose very many. There's not much churn. You know? That's fascinating and really unusual for a music teacher, I'd have thought, especially guitar. 
yes, uh, I sat down uh, because at the time I was partnering a music shop business and went through all the syllabi and thought, this doesn't actually teach people to play very much. It teaches them the conventional rules, but it doesn't teach them the mechanics and the, the essential nature of the instrument. Mm -hmm. Because my background is actually in science and business rather than as a, a professional musician. I, this was something I did as a, as a hobby for donkey's years, and I was awful at it for a, a very long time. But by taking the approach of an analyst and saying, like, what would I do first if I really needed to make significant advances quickly? What would be the most useful thing for me to learn? And then later, having insights from other fields and disciplines, like, ah, if I do that, huh. then everything can be streamlined. So you came at it with fresh eyes. Absolutely. And then you developed your expertise. And that thing that, that if I do that, that's that thing of being able to be reflective, isn't it? Because you work out what works and you do more of that. And you've got that freedom to design your own curriculum. Yes. It's fascinating. And of course, the more that you look beyond the mainstream, the, the sort of center line of, of your conventional thinking, you can nick ideas from everyone. Steal ideas from everyone. They call it research if you steal from more than one, but plagiarism if you just pinch it from one person. Teachers, I always tell the tutors, teachers are magpies. Absolutely. Yeah, so tutors have to be confident to just take what works and make use of it. Yeah, whatever works. It could be that I'm using a ridiculous metaphor or drawing a simile between a, a pattern or shape on the neck or something that my student does in everyday life. I'm very keen to find out what they do in their daytime job because I'm working quite a lot with adults yeah if I can find out what they do in their day job I can recruit whatever they do and is familiar to them and put it on the fretboard or enter it into their guitar playing experience so there's a parallel I'm just yeah. strapping an idea onto what's already there yeah incredibly useful to me Neil know what they do really interesting so the more life experience the better generally yes the easiest people to teach, believe it or not, are accountants. Ah! <laughs> Why is that? <laughs> a pattern or shape on the, on the neck as a Microsoft Excel or a spreadsheet grid. <laughs> if I take a, a scale pattern. Yeah. Like, say, so this, A3, B2, right. If I move it up one semitone, one fret, the pattern doesn't change. Or right. change. So from there move it up, move it up again. Now, the accountants see that as just a cut and paste operation. Right. Because it is. It is. I do that all the time. Right. And I do all my graphics in Microsoft Excel. For Ma music. Because it's a grid-based instrument. Yeah. And maybe that should be, um, maybe that should be the marketing for this podcast then. Dear accountants, <laughs> how to become guitar players. <laughs> That's a niche. <laughs> Copy and paste. And they follow. Miss, or they play. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so, Neil, so what, what, what do you look to inspire in your tutees, apart from obviously expert level guitar playing? Uh, the most important thing for me is to uh, free, if you like, all the parts of them that have been shut down. Generally, it's the kid that wanted to sing who's been told they sound like a cat being strangled and hasn't sung for 59 years, or as one lady had, uh, who was able to go back to the person who told her that and sing at their bedside as they were, as they were dying, just to say, you know, I can sing. Mm. And, I've learned. And that was a tearful moment for both of us when she told me that story. Or yeah. the guy who's been told he has no musical talents, who's a DJ but now he's also a pretty good bass player because we've been able to liberate that creative spirit. I think all children are born with this incredible spark of creativity and untapped potential. And as we enter what I consider to be the compliance factory system of, of mainstream schooling, that fire is made to die down, to make them controllable, which is... I think part of my own school experience of being very bright 
but not being challenged by the lessons and wanting something else. Neil, it's at this exact moment that I'm going to bring you back to that first question because I feel like what you're, I don't want to preempt anything, but what you've just been saying is that the school system didn't work for you. And we find that a lot of uh, students who go uh, in search of a tutor, that is the reason that they, that they do so, is because the school system doesn't work for them. Did you have a tutor? No, I didn't. Um, I come from, a, I would say, a, a pretty solid lower working class background on a big scroll, sprawling council estate in Wolverhampton where expectations were very low. Uh, there was a lot of what I would call socialist propaganda flying around where mm -hmm. you were expected to just go along with what you were told and you weren't really important, you were just a cog in the machine. Mm -hmm. and so how did you, where, where did you channel that intelligence? Where did you take that essentially it's like rebelling from school, but obviously, uh, you know, a, a desire to learn. Well, I, I read continuously uh, from a very early age. I was into non-fiction. I read all of the encyclopedias that we had back then. Uh, it was at the library once a week, maxing out my tickets. And I think it was about nine when they gave me an adult ticket to the non-fiction section. <laughs> I walked five miles to the library, fill my rucksack up with books track home and then be back doing it again the next weekend voracious reader fantastic you're an autodidact absolutely yeah it's such a powerful uh, form of learning isn't it because you have inspired that in yourself rather than having it potentially artificially kind of imposed on you yeah as i say it's up to you nobody's coming to the rescue mm. ah. whatever happens in your life is under your control so, Neil, I feel like I've never picked up a guitar in, 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 in earnest, but I feel already that I would learn probably a whole a great deal of things about myself, not just about my guitar playing in a, in a session with you. What, how, 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 do you transfer that method of learning and, and teaching and learning to your students, or do you feel that you only impose that if you see fit? No, I try to infect them with my optimism. <laughs> and sense of potential across all aspects of their life, not just as a guitar player, because what they learn on the guitar about their own potential is it's going to cross-fertilize everything else they do, whether it's one of my students who wants to change their business model, we sit down and we'll talk about that. You know, we'll just put the kettle on, make some coffee and, and talk business strategy. Or someone wants to learn a foreign language, we could talk about that. Yeah. I think my duty is to go where I am most useful with the student. So if they have an idea to to write, to compose music, we'll do that. If they have another problem, and my most useful role is to be a good listener, then I'll just shut up and listen. It's to be useful. That's my driving aim. And that's, and that's something that you're sort of constantly searching for, constantly assessing. Where's my most useful space here? What's my most useful objective? Absolutely. Because um, I'm in the position in, in life at the moment where I don't have to do this. I just choose to do it because I, I feel only half alive when I'm not doing it. When I'm deprived from teaching, sitting on a beach, all I want to do is get back in the room, get a guitar in my hands and start making a change for other people so they can have a lot more fun, make a boatload of noise, grin like maniacs and <laughs> being alive. Love it. Tell us about your waiting list. Always have one. Go on. <laughs> have a waiting list. There's a limit on how many hours in the week I'll teach. So I won't... I won't do 70, 80 hours of teaching a week anymore. I'll cap it. And having a waiting list obviously positions me as someone who is of value. If they, if they can step right in, I must have lots of spaces. Therefore, the perceptions I can't be very good. Uh -huh. If I have a void space, I'll fill it from the waiting list. Right. At the moment, things are a bit strange because we're doing some room sessions and some Zoom sessions. Yeah. Room and Zoom, I like that. <laughs> it's, it's a bit of a, a Swiss cheese approach at the moment. There are whole <laughs> because people who are on the waiting list don't want to do it on Zoom. Right. Right. 
Okay. Two delivery channels are sort of flipping and flopping at the moment. And keep it PG rated, but please tell us who you don't work with. Okay, uh, simple <laughs> from a very successful entrepreneur and author called Pete Thompson. I've got to give him credit for this. He's DDWT, and that's don't deal with tossers. <laughs> Anyone who mucks you around, who's just half half baked about things and doesn't treat you with respect, that's the most, most important thing. Just don't deal with them. Fire them. There are plenty of other people in the world. Your success or failure as a teacher can be found in any one of the other 7 billion people on this planet rather than the idiot in front of you. If you have to fire someone, fire your idiots. It's fantastic. It's fantastic. Yeah. We've spoken about freelancing before, haven't we? And yeah. how challenging it is to sort of keep control of your own number of hours and list of students, but you owe it to yourself to do that because you don't have an organisation or a line manager who's going to do it for you. So you have to, you have to manage your own time and expectations and I mean the idea of sacking a student is something that nobody's ever said before but but it's true if they don't show up on time they don't treat you with respect we talk about respect as being reciprocal and at some point if if the student side doesn't if the student doesn't reciprocate it's not going to be a learning experience is it no it's not and of course if you have someone whose behavior disrupts what you do with all of your other students they're making you look like an idiot. Mm -hmm. if, if someone shows up half an hour late and they expect the lesson to overrun, they're difficult about it, it's just going to make you look a pudding. Mm -hmm. Or not in control, yeah. It's funny, isn't it? Because when you start out in whatever field you're in, you are looking for, for as a freelance, uh, you know, a freelance, so you're looking for clients, aren't you? You want that, that work. And as you're, as you're, business grows then you kind of cut away the people that cause you uh you know to lose sleep or lose time or you know cause you to be inefficient yeah how neil when you started out i assume you took anyone who came because that was the beginning of a business and i assume very quickly you also began to streamline who you took on as clients so someone who's new to tutoring how, how, do they, how do you mediate those early days where you're not quite sure if that's the kind of client that you want to continue with, but you need, obviously, to, to, to build, your, build your business? Okay. I would say that if the moment they walk in the room, you just get that feeling of, I don't want to work with this person. Mm -hmm. Your duty is probably to find out a little more about them and clarify that first gut reaction. If they're not the right person for you to work with, direct them to someone who would be a better fit. Because at least that way you're being of help to them. Oh. And that is a what goes around comes around thing. If I refer, say, a classical guitar student, because I'm primarily rock and pop, to the local classical teacher, he will send rockers to me. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's right. If someone calls about another instrument and it's not my forte, I will find them someone that I know, like, and trust who can help them. Do you have a network of tutors that you... Absolutely, yes. Um, from working in the school's peripatetic circuit, I've still got the contacts within that who all tutor privately as well. So if I can help them by helping someone who's not a good fit for me or someone's after something that I don't provide, then everyone wins. Fantastic. And I win because I've been useful. Talk to us for a minute about working as a peripatetic music teacher. So you're, on the one hand, your own man. I'm, and on the other hand, you're, you have to have that contextual literacy of right, arriving in the school, using their behavior management systems, um, following their, you know, getting sort of in tune with their tone, but also being this new, fresh face who's doing things differently. How, talk to us about that. Okay, this is actually something I don't do anymore, but I'm happy to discuss what I used to do and the approach I took. Uh, I was invited to go and do that because I was teaching the local headmaster's son who asked me to go teach at this school, and I'd always said no to the request before. And I said, if I come, I'm going to do exactly what I do here. So you can keep your ABRSM grades and your rock school grades because, by and large, they are not as efficient as this. And he said, yeah, just come, come and subvert things. 
And then two days later, I got a phone call from another head of music uh, who's been trying to get me to do it for years. And then suddenly, I've, in three weeks, I've got four schools, which is three, four days out. From right. Uh, when the property side of things, the other, the other things that I do became too busy, then I stepped back from that. So this is retrospective. Going to schools, express yourself, express your ideas. Know the rules of the school. Mm -hmm. be professional. Show up on time with all your kit, with all your materials, and be ready. Ah. Be ready for anything. The kids will come at you with all sorts of strange ideas. <laughs> did you um? Did you come across a student like yourself? Yes. Ah. Oh. Quite a few. Did you shake him by the hand? <laughs> did you shake him by the hand? Yeah, I said well, you're obviously one of my tribe. <laughs> we're going to get on great because I was exactly like you right uh, he sort of said what do you mean by that yeah. well I've already been told what you're like and what the teachers have told me is your x y z to me that just means you're brighter than the school can currently cope with within their limited framework in this room you have no limits let's play oh and he kind of grinned wonder what the catch was for a few minutes and then we just got on and, and worked. Fantastic. Fantastic. And he's a private student now. So. I was going to ask you that. <clears throat> How's he doing? Wonderfully. Oh. Wonderfully. Well. He, needs, he needed a tutor. I think he just needed the right, the right catalyst. That's, that's really what I am as a, as a tutor, I think, is I'm the, the facilitator of a, of a reaction. So the, if you like, the accelerating agent that causes things to move more quickly. He would have got there eventually under his own steam, but it might have taken him decades. Right. And that's that mental role that you assume, isn't it? I tell you what, you know, linking it back to your being a reader as a child uh, and the fact that you're self-taught, isn't that interesting that you think about it as unlocking or catalyzing learning for a student because you know it's already there and you expect him to take responsibility for his learning whereas we're used to a model of spoon feeding and supervising students yeah absolutely if you are aware of the the driving principles behind anything and you remove the limits on that the, the principles can be applied amplified modified tweaked or just mucked around with for want of a better phrase you know, I'll say the rules don't change. The locking of potential is, is our job. That's right. So we talk about barriers for learning quite a bit. And sometimes those are special educational needs and sometimes those are mental health. And sometimes it's, it, it's, it's just an experience that happened when you were four years old that you didn't realise had such a knock-on effect. How do you... You've spoken about how you spot those because you talked about listening. How do you respond to those? I try to understand the frame through which they're viewing the encounter. As a, as a student, if they've had a particularly scaly experience at school, or have been yelled at or shouted at or criticised for making a mistake, recognise that that's there mm. and give them a different frame. Mm. Mistake, it's just a note you didn't want. So that's you effectively ranging around the note that you did want to try and locate it you know there are no mistakes on in music there are just the notes you want and the notes you didn't want and there are no wrong ones they're all usable right you know, the more notes you play the more jazzy you tend to sound <laughs> so if you want to play pop music you just play these six or seven notes and if you want to play jazz you add a few more And now, a brief word from our founder, Julia Silva. If you'd like to hear more about the ideas we touch on here, or gain the tools to take your own tutoring to the next level, the qualification for tutors could be for you. This live online seminar is facilitated by industry experts who, over four Zoom workshops, will cover the foundations of teaching and learning and how it relates to you as a tutor. The workshops are full of rich discussions where you'll learn alongside other tutors and connect on a professional level. We will teach you how to be the kind of tutor 
every child remembers. Visit our community space at qualifiedtutorcommunity.org and sign up now for our transformative course. We'll see you there. It leads me on to some thinking that I have about feedback. And we're actually just writing a course about the power of feedback in tutoring because the evidence says that that's really where the magic happens. Where, where a student tries something and then they adjust it, then they're, they're able to learn from that process of it's not this, but it's that. And of course, in music, the feedback is much more immediate than it is in maths, because in maths, you have to get to the end of the problem or the end of the sheet or the end of the page or for somebody else to mark it. But in music, you can hear when it's off straight away. Yes. You have an immediate feedback when you're playing, but then you have this outlook of, well, but no, no, it's wrong. It's just not for right now. Yeah. Um, if, if someone hits a note which isn't part of our key or uh -huh. is off the scale pattern that we're using at the time, and they grimace. Ah, that's very interesting. You've just found one of the chili notes. Ah, uh, you know, one of the chili notes, like a chili. Chili. Mm. You know, you might use that once in a while to enhance the flavour of the basic ingredients, but we don't want too many chili notes. We want the right chili note at the right time. We're going to come back to that one later. But it's cool that you found it already. Ah, uh, you'll be coming back to that. So it's the same thing as that barrier that you just said. You saw something and you showed it to them. Yeah. Oh, that's what you saw there. Now let's go back to what we're what, what we're aiming on today. Yeah, it's cool. You know, if someone hits a a, bum, a chromatic note, and it's not what we want, I'll say, okay, that's cool. Let's just do that exact same note again because you'll be doing that later. That's a little more advanced than we're at at the moment. So you're getting ahead of me. <laughs> Catch you up, because we just want to make sure the safe path is there first before we start doing the the adrenaline pumping white knuckle stuff you know so they get a sense of there's a long road ahead mm. and and that you're the sort of pathfinder with them mm. well, i would say that i'm a, a, a bit like an old hand in the mountains if you like who's guiding someone up, up a, a treacherous ascent or across an, a, a knife-edged arete ridge and i'm kind of going it's this way guys come on yeah over here you just put your hand there mm. it's okay this isn't going to kill you trust the, the downside of any dismal cock-up on the guitar is extremely low. You know, you might have a few moments of unpleasant variations in air pressure, and that's all it is. Right. Yeah. Nobody dies. The music police don't come and batter the door down. High challenge, low risk. Yeah. I think um, we, we, we get that sometimes as tutors. I know in my own tutoring, for example, something very compar comparable to that is that students in the middle of a certain area, a certain topic of, I don't know, say English or maths, they'll mention something that they've learned at school or they've heard at school, but which is way beyond where they are at that time. And you just say, okay, brilliant. Let's just look at that for, for five minutes. And you've mentioned it, you've brought it up. It's clearly important in your mind. It's not the right step for the progress of this area, but we'll look at it because I'm not just going to shut you down. And I'm not just going to say that, no, 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 you, ca you can't learn that now because Students can learn anything at any time, but you're in charge of uh, kind of directing the wider progress of that student. So you say to them, OK, that's what this is. Here's where it fits in. Keep that. Keep that in the back of your mind. We'll have a look at that in two weeks time. First of all, we need to get through this first stage because that's what schools unfortunately can't do. Sometimes they have to jump ahead because that's what they're you know, demanded to do by the curriculum. But there are students who are left behind. So those students kind of hear something in class and they go, oh, it's that. And you go, it is that, but it's not that just yet. <laughs> um, and I, I think, yeah. yeah. I had an equivalent experience. Um, I was working with a year three student the other day and I did square numbers with him and I said, you know, this is year five maths, don't you? And he was so pleased. He just walked tall and I said to him, and when it comes up in the lesson, you're going to know it. It's going to be familiar to, to you. And for a student who's riddled with misconceptions and therefore always on the back foot, you just give him a secret weapon. When square numbers come up, he's going to feel like such a winner. <laughs> and there's, there's, some, there's something there that uh, I would just like to, to sort of wave my hand about because I think it's really important as a tutor is when we use the word but, for instance, when, <gasps> that's a really interesting thing, but... <laughs> That, that's a, a negation 
of any positive. So if I say, that's really interesting, but mm -hmm. now they're waiting for me to say something negative. I always use mm -hmm. the word and. Mm -hmm. So I tend not to use the, the B word in mm -hmm. the teaching room. So if I say that was fantastic, James, but now James knows that he's about to get a kick in the backside, having had a pat on the head. If you go, that was really interesting, James, and yeah. mm -hmm. that negation. So I think uh, we should be pristine in our language wherever possible. Because understanding the power of the words that you're choosing and, and how resonant they are with your students is massive. I rephrased a sentence yesterday, a piece of feedback that I was giving a tutor, actually, and I had put the word but in there. And when I scanned it over, I was like, whoa, that word is that word is loaded. And I, I, I smoothed it right out. And the whole, you know, it's quite equivalent to the evidence that says that if you give in, a, in feedback, if you give a student a grade, they don't look past the grade. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And that, that's true. Everyone who enters my teaching room is a high achiever. People, oh. they wouldn't be there. <laughs> so I, I'm setting the frame at, this is gonna be fantastic. You're gonna be great at this. It's gonna be a laugh. We're gonna hang out, make a load of noise, giggle, make fun of ourselves, and it's gonna be enjoyable. Mm -hmm. And the power of not yet over uh, never. Julia, I know Julia's beaming from ear to ear for this one because it's her, <laughs> it's, it's her favorite one. You know, the, 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 the kind of, as you say, the kick in the backside that you give a student when you say no is huge. They look up to where you're directing them. And you, if you say that answer is wrong or what you've just done is wrong or did you get this right? No. That's such a sort of weight, isn't it? That's such a drop. Yes. Whereas not yet, or you're almost there, or uh, Julia's one, the favourite one again, would you like to try that again? They're so powerful. I'll give you another one, Ludo. There's a fantastic book called The Art of Possibility. And don't read it, listen to it, because it's narrated on audiobook by the authors, and one is a musician, and it's interspersed with classical music. It is a most wonderful listen. Um, and one of their chapters is called Give Them an A. And that's exactly what Neil just said. Let them walk into the room, tell them they're winners, and then ask them how they're going to, sh how they're going to unlock that winning, um, that winning attitude, how, what success is going to look like to them. And then you're sort of plotting a route backwards. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. I totally agree with that. Give them an A, and all they can do is take it away from themselves. I tell you another thing he says that you'll love, Neil. Um, he talks about edge of your seat playing. <laughs> yes, that kind of that kind of attentiveness. Ludo and I watch our fantastic participants leaning in in sessions, um, and that's where we know that the good stuff's happening because that sort of that sort of he calls it one buttock playing because he's sort of leaning right forward, and it's a fantastic. It's a fantastic eagerness that we love to see in our students, right? Um, yeah? There you go, the art of possibility. Yeah, so I'll, I'll clench. Next <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's a scary thought. Don't, don't hold that thought in your mind. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not use that as a snippet, Ludo. <laughs> um, Definitely, that won't make it. I'm finished. No. Oh, oh we've got yeah. quite a Background. Who's that? That was, I don't think that came from me. Did that come from you, Neil? <laughs> no. Neil, so I just want to quickly touch upon how you transferred from, from room to Zoom, really. Okay. Um, because obviously that was that was could have been a tough time, especially for, for a guitar player, but it sounds like you've you pivoted and adapted sort of very, very swiftly. Yes, I could sense where we were being taken in terms of legislation and having our ability to move freely and associate freely away. So um, when the announcement was, was expected, I was in the computer shop buying up lots of gadgets and wiggly bits, having figured out what I would need to do to deliver effective content. Um, most importantly of all, I bought a bunch of lights. That's mm -hmm. made the difference. There is nearly 10,000 Kelvins of light in here. 10,000 lumens, not Kelvins. 
Um, Are you getting a suntan? Red. Uh, no, they're, they're low-power LED strip light things. And they're all the way around me here. Yeah. And there's a key light in front to lift the shadows. So they're all up out the way. That, that's the most important thing. Figuring out how to be properly illuminated was, was the big thing. The cameras, there are just a couple of SLRs there. The main screen share from the studio computer, another screen share feed from the laptop, the laptop camera, an HD web camera, and this little gadget on here, which I know Julie is quite partial to. This is the onboard 4K camera. Come on. You want to see this thing? You, you're so weird. <laughs> <laughs> she thrives on that word. Yeah. Well, it's a fabulous word. It comes from the English word mean, uh, weird, which means having the power to control your destiny. Oh, just in your podcast. That was worth getting up for. It's it's totally you know when someone says oh you're weird, I go that's the nicest thing you've ever said. <laughs> so this is the, the. I would tell my teenagers that. <laughs> so as I just move up this little scale like this, you can see exactly what I'm doing. I can move it around to show a little more of what's happening at the back of the neck where my thumb position is. If I'm working on right hand pick technique or finger picking, I can just swing it around. What, what I love here is that this is a video, but also a podcast. So for those who are listening to the audio version, what Neil is doing is he is taking us through the different camera angles that he can use during his teaching. And to be honest, I'm, I'm mesmerized. There's such close up action here. You can see both Neil's left and right hands on the guitar. Yeah. And for instance, if I'm, working with, with someone playing metal I'll just I'll show them exactly what I'm doing with the pick and I'll play. and yeah the muting is there that it's like having their eyes six or seven inches away from where I'm, I'm hitting the strings of the pick which by the way they don't do when they're in the room do they in a way you're actually guiding their focus more than you would if they were in the room Yes, and, and this uh, guitar with camera migrates down to the in-room room, which is downstairs in the house. Um, I'm pretty fortunate I've got a reasonable size house and I can just fill it with guitars and toys. <laughs> Fantastic. I'm interested to know about, you mentioned lighting before, and I think that what you were saying was that not just that your students need to be able to see you, but also that they need to be able to feel comfortable learning with you. And there's something about being properly illuminated and properly representing yourself as a tutor. So we talk about the seven P's of professionalism and preparedness and presentation give really, really key indicators about who you are as an educator and the fact that you're trustworthy and a person to, a person to, be, um, to be followed. A, a, a person with whom people can create alignment and there's something about line about lighting and cameras and technology that allows the user experience to flow and be really really comfortable that you've enabled here so if your tech was lumpy and awkward it would indicate fairly or unfairly something about your guitar teaching absolutely it would say that i couldn't be bothered to get it together hmm. Whereas taking, for me, five days to have everything up, running, implemented, and robust, that was five days well invested. Yeah. Yeah, it showed you're bothered. I didn't have anything else to do within, within a teaching domain in that time. I thought, let's just focus on it. So it, yeah. it was five days. But the first reaction from students was, whoa, yeah. this is way better than I was expecting. They were yeah. being the webcam on the on the laptop and spotty audio rather than everything going through a, a good audio interface and pro mics and the guitar di'd into that so the audio was very important to me mm. lighting super important and having it not falling over all the time uh-huh just the stability yeah. mm -hmm. if something's not reliable it's no good Mm -hmm. That's a very sort of military approach. If you have a weapon that's super accurate, but it only fires once in a blue moon, it's a ghastly liability to you. Right, because you're relying on it.
Yeah. So Vishal said to us, didn't he, um, from Educator, he said, what's your backup plan? With online, you always have to have a backup plan. So yeah. at the beginning of this uh, pod, before we started recording, we, um, we checked out a few of your cameras, didn't we, Neil? And some of them were more successful for this meeting than others, and that was totally fine. Um, because you had more than one plan up your sleeves. Yeah. There are how many? One, two, three, four, five, six. Six direct cameras and two screen feeds. So, yeah. Uh, unless there is a deeply rooted problem within the machine itself, they all run rubber. Yeah. I, I think there's a, there's a whole lot there for, for online learners. And in fact, when we are able to find the time to bring together live streamers from several different disciplines, Neil, um, we would love to have you there. We want to show, you know, the listeners of ours and also tutors of all different fields, not just academic, you know, French and maths and English tutors, how to deliver sessions online because it's obviously very, very important. And although there is lots out there, I haven't seen kind of a big round table where you bring together you know, four or five live streamers from different fields and, and you talk about how each one you know um, sets up their 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 kind of recording equipment and, and you obviously have done that and, and that's that would be bring a huge amount to the conversation just just before we finish up neil i just wanted to ask one final question sure the title of your podcast mm-hmm. where it could have been so many things why did it, why did you settle on the tutor podcast um simply because i think what I do as a tutor slash businessman is useful to everyone. I have this silly idea that I want to be useful to as many people as possible, as much as possible, and to help them. Now, I know an awful lot of tutors out there, not just guitar tutors, who are super tutors, but are hopeless at business. They, they don't have that in their tool bag. Now, I've got that in my tool bag from way back. So if I can bring any of that and make it accessible to them and save them a lot of money, a little bit of hassle, give them insight or even just an emotional uplift along the way, then I'd be useful. Yeah. It doesn't cost me anything to give that stuff away. All I'm doing is trying to increase the amount of knowledge so that other people can have a, a, a love affair with their tutoring business, the same as I have, to, to maximize their potential as, as tutors. Basically, if there's an aspect of your business that's running out of control or you're skinned, you're not making any money, you don't have enough students, you're not going to be focused entirely on the job in hand, which is helping your students. Yeah. It's, to me, it's all about being useful, being helpful. Yeah. Your podcast is really helpful. I I told you I binge listened to the whole lot, the whole lot in one go. And... Um, I there there are some additions to my tutoring toolbox that'll be there forever, um, and that I'll always reference you for. So um, so thank you because it's it's really really generous for somebody with with um, hard earned expertise to share it to share it, and that's what we're all about over here, and that's why we're really happy to have you as a member of our community. Yeah, it's my pleasure to be here. Brilliant. Neil, thank you so, so much. Julia, thank you very much for, for joining us today as well. If you want to listen to the Tutor podcast, it's on all major podcast platforms. it um, been going for around two and a half years. There's loads of episodes, loads of content to get through. Um, but Neil, uh, thank you so much again. Uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, running us through your equipment. I'm sure you do that several times over. Um, <laughs> it, was, uh, it was a real pleasure to get to, get to know you a little bit better as well, Neil. Um, and... Uh, as Julia said, if you'd like to, to join our community, if you'd like to uh, sort of chat to Neil, you can do so at, at uh, qualifiedtutorcommunity.org. Thank you very much, both of you, and we'll see you all again next time. See you later. See you soon. See you soon, guys. Thanks, Neil. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thanks for listening to the Qualified Tutor Podcast where tutors share their expertise to support the tutoring community. If you'd like to continue the conversation, join our Qualified Tutor Community at www.qualifiedtutorcommunity.org or find it in the show notes below. We exist to connect, share and learn with you because tutoring is a small job that makes a big difference.